We're on a mission from God. Wendy? Stay away! So I got that going. Darling? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Light of my life. We enjoy your films. I am a human being. I thought they smelled bad on the outside. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in real time, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 40th anniversary of the release of Tribute. On December 19th, 1980, it was written by Bernard Slade, based on his own play of the same name, directed by Bob Clark, and released by 20th Century Fox. The day after its release, Ben Sharpstein, director of Dumbo, Pinocchio, and Snow White, passed away. Hmm. Hopefully, he didn't see this one. <laughs> Playwright and screenwriter Bernard Slade based this work on Harvey Orkin, an agent at the London offices of talent agency ICM, who made regular appearances on the talk show circuit and also suffered very publicly with a terminal illness. The original Broadway run of Tribute lasted from June to December of 1978, Jack Lemmon played the lead role on stage and reprised it for the film as it was written specifically for him. And he hadn't appeared on stage in, I think, 18 years uh, between his previous Broadway appearance and this run. Well, obviously, I didn't see the play, but from what I imagine the play was like, I feel like he performed it exactly the same as he did on stage. I wouldn't doubt that for a second. <laughs> Uh, his son in the Broadway production was Robert Picardo. Oh. Yeah, I thought you'd like that. Arthur Hiller was attached to direct for a while before stepping away from the project. Earlier this year, he was listed as a backup director in case first-time director Rob Cohen didn't work out for a small circle of friends. Jack Lemmon taught himself to play piano and actually composed the theme for this film. There was a theme? Yeah, it's, he plays it on the piano a couple times, and it plays a lot over the ending uh, montage. That's a pretty song. Oh, thank you. Maybe someday I'll get an ending for it. How long have you been working on it? You, 20 years. What do you call it? Lack of discipline. What else? We should also mention that uh, he didn't teach himself to play piano for this movie. Correct. He, he, he learned how this to play piano. the competition. Yeah, he learned he how to learned... play piano over time on his own. Yes, but by himself. Yeah, self-taught. Jack Lemmon was nominated for an Oscar and Golden Globe for Best Lead Actor. He was awarded the Silver Bear by the Berlin Film Festival for Best Actor and a Canadian Genie for Best Foreign Actor. He was also nominated for a Tony Award for having played the same character in the stage production. We have a tilted zero in our 20th Century Fox logo to start the film. And we will for another couple of years. You probably don't need to point it out. I'm going to say it every time. <laughs> but is it a zero? The, the, oh, the, the, the yeah. two yeah two yeah. o yeah fox that'd be weird no but i mean it, <laughs> no, I, no I, I i miss i misspoke but i don't know what we're talking about <laughs> the, the, the zero 20th century in the 20th fox century logo. fox uh, oh, okay. is, is diagonal slanted. okay we mentioned it on an earlier episode and so he's gonna bring it up every time now i see just to rub it in we open on Times square Scotty Templeton, played by Jack Lemmon, comes out of a revolving door and hails a taxi. His co-worker, Lou Daniels, leans out of an open window upstairs and asks how best to reach him in Vegas. He says, don't worry about it. I'll reach out to you. Hey, listen, stay on top of the Hillary thing, will you? I've got a client list right here. I'll see you in a couple of days. He tells the driver to take him to New York Hospital. Hey, I thought you were going to Vegas. I lied. We cut to someone processing photographs in a dark room. They are of a younger Jack Lemon in a chicken costume, entertaining his wife and young son. These are either very well done photoshops, or Robbie Benson and Jack Lemon met at some event in the past. Mm -hmm. I think <laughs> it's a just a photoshop. <laughs> yes. At the hospital, Scotty climbs into a crowded elevator, and when he gets out on his floor, he stops, turns around, and says, Hold it a minute, everybody. I got this great idea. Let's all meet a year from today. This is the first of many jokes from Lemon over the course of the next two hours that will not land for the people in the scene or the people watching. Scotty sneaks around the floor 
where his appointment is scheduled at the hospital and just peeks in random rooms until he finds a young woman in one of them. He sneaks away to snag a doctor's scrubs as well as a stethoscope and then wanders into her room posing as a doctor. The patient is played by Kim Cattrall. He places the microphone end of the stethoscope on her breast and touches it lightly with his hand, pretending to listen for a heartbeat. But the other end of the stethoscope isn't connected It's not to in anything. his ears. Mm -hmm. uh, shouldn't those go in your ears? Uh, no, that just confuses me. The patient has already determined that this is not a doctor, but is for some reason letting this strange man grope her. <sighs> she pretends to find all of this vaudeville comedy very funny. She calls him out as another patient, and they flirt back and forth for a moment until Scotty is pulled away by his physician, Gladys. I don't know why she's tolerating this at all. Like, I don't it, like, either. He is just a creepy old man in a hospital that is trying to harass her. The only reason you would put up with this at all is if it was literally Jack Lemon. <laughs> and you were like, I recognize you. You're a famous person who I know isn't a total creep. I still don't think yeah, I, I would let some guy like that grope me in you're a You're never going to believe this. <laughs> Jack Lemon's a total fucking pervert weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you just tell people the next day. He signed my boobs. <laughs> I didn't ask him to. Yeah. <laughs> Gladys walks him down the hall and they take a seat in a conference room. The door closes in front of us so that the conversation is muted and they give him what looks like some bad news. Traumatic piano music underscores the scene and we see him asking some questions and coming to terms with what they're telling him. They leave him alone for a moment in the room to collect his thoughts and then he redresses and leaves the hospital outside he sees the appendectomy patient kim cattrall's character sally and she's hailing a taxi but he gets into it with her and apparently takes her straight home like did they just go straight to his house no, no he offered her like lunch or dinner or something like that he's like ah oh, but we don't see any of that food to no. get this out, taste out of our mouths yeah at first it looks like they've slept together because he's playing the piano at home in a smoking jacket and she's coming down the stairs behind him, but then they spell it out very blatantly. We didn't even go to bed together. Well, I can answer that, Well, It's the age difference. You're too old for me. So apparently she did stay the night, though, because it is yeah. the next day. And maybe they did sleep together, but nothing happened. He asks her to make some coffee and then asks about her modeling career. It sounds like she's more of an in-person model for like conventions and stuff, not as much photography oriented. Why she did he bring her here? I don't know. It's so weird and gross. She compliments the tune he's playing on the piano and he says he's been working on it for 20 years, which might be true. I don't know. Scotty instructs Sally to pull on the fourth book over from the right on their bookshelf. And when she does, an entire wet bar reveals itself. She notices a framed photo of Scotty's son, Judd. Scotty tells her that Judd took the picture because he was always good with the camera, but this also is a subliminal dig at himself for not taking pictures of his own kids. Yeah. I, I also like that he took such a nice photograph of himself. Yeah. Like, the, that's the, how good he is. Yeah. They talk about Scotty's career, and apparently he was a writer of films, but didn't like the isolation of the job. We cut to Judd and Scotty's ex-wife in the backseat of a taxi on their way to see him. Judd says it's been three years since he last saw his father. Judd is obviously worried about seeing him after so much time away. Before she leaves, Scotty asks Sally to give him a peck on the cheek, but he turns his head at the last second to catch her kiss. She leaves her number behind and probably also an address because they need that later. Mm -hmm. And she walks out the door just as Scotty's family is pulling up actually too close together like they for sure would have noticed this college age right. girl walking out of their 50 something right. year old dad's apartment another example of the distance that scotty likes to keep from his own son he doesn't answer the door instead he just calls down to judd to come on in when he sees his ex-wife maggie instead he's caught off guard because apparently he wasn't expecting her they seem to have a good relationship despite their divorce when judd comes in he offers his father a handshake, but Scotty insists on a sloppy bear hug. Judd announces to his father that he's been offered and is accepting a teaching position one week from today. He did ask for time off for this visit, uh, but it's a ticking clock that doesn't really get brought up much for the rest of the story, and it's not super relevant. It's kind of like in the competition, yeah. where it's like, oh, I have to accept this job right away, or mm -hmm. not. I don't, it doesn't really matter. 
When Judd heads upstairs to unpack his stuff, Scotty makes jokes about how they can't possibly be related because they're so different. He mentions how Judd used to have a sense of humor and that he would dance around in a chicken costume and his son would laugh hysterically. That's what we saw the picture of earlier. Scotty makes it clear that he's a little upset about Judd's abbreviated visit and Maggie can tell that something's wrong. She calls him out and eventually he confesses to her. I spent a little time in the hospital, Maggie. It, it turns out I'm in less than perfect health. Oh, how imperfect. Well, I'll tell you, when they uh, advise you to get your affairs in order, you tend to think they're posting a closing notice. Maggie understands now why he would like Judd to stay a little bit longer, but agrees not to tell him at the moment. She offers to talk him into a longer visit on her own, and she relays Scotty's desire for Judd to stay, but Judd is insulted that his father couldn't make this request himself. Regardless, he agrees to extend his visit. Scotty walks Maggie to a taxi to leave? She has a flight out in the morning, so I guess Scotty doesn't care about having very little time with her? Like she just came here to walk her son into the apartment and then turn around and leave? Well, I'm assuming that he's living with her. With who? His mother. No, he's saying that Scotty doesn't have a, doesn't care about... Yeah, it just seems weird that he's like, oh, wait, my yeah. son's only going to be here for a week? And it's like, yeah, my, my ex-wife can leave in 20 minutes. That's mm. fine. I don't need to see. Well, she think... literally came the whole way here to turn around immediately. They seem to have a good relationship in general, though. Right, but it just seems weird to me that she had to escort her 20-something-year-old child to this apartment. Like, he's about to take a job at a school somewhere. He can't find his way to his dad's apartment. Maybe maybe she needed to go with him to make sure that he actually goes. Maybe. <laughs> That's true. Alone with his son, Scotty tries to do some bonding and even offers up a girl he knows as a potential date. We then get a very weird conversation between the men. Scotty talks about how he has found dates for Judd in the past, and Judd says, hey, since you brought that up, when I got back to Canada, I found out that that girl that you set me up with had given me a dose of VD. You're kidding. Why didn't you tell me? Well, the damage was done. I mean, it was a little late to do anything to prevent it. Maybe for you, implying, I guess, that Scotty was also interested in yeah. his son's sloppy seconds when he was 16 years old? Judd refuses his father's help finding a girl. Scott goes into an old stand-up routine that he and Judd apparently had memorized when Judd was a kid, but he doesn't remember it anymore. Scotty brings Judd to his office, where they meet with his partner, Lou Daniels, and he's presenting him with all these messages from people trying to reach him. He mentions two calls from a Dr. Petrelli, that's the Gladys character, but Judd doesn't seem to catch on. Scotty's secretary enters and says that the limo is here to take them to Hillary's party. I don't understand what Scotty does for a living. He seems like he's an agent, like some kind of talent representative. Yeah. yeah. But this client, Hillary, is a like a celebrity escort? Mm -hmm. She's like a prostitute? She's, a, she's definitely a prostitute. I she's mean, happy hooker goes Hollywood. I guess. Did did they have agents, like entertainment agency? Maybe she was a perk. I don't know. Well, well, maybe that that's her line of work, but she maybe she also does modeling or... Maybe. Either way, it just seemed... It was throwing me off because I was like, is he a pimp or an agent? What I is happening? I think he's both. Mm -hmm. But actually later, not to spoil anything, but I don't think she does do other stuff because he's like, oh, you could have been an actress later. Yeah. Mm. Apparently, they're heading to a party for Hillary, but Judd would rather go to a photography exhibit at the Natural History Museum. We cut to Hillary, Scotty, and Judd in the back of the limo headed to the party. Hillary is just chatting up Judd nonstop while Scotty laughs on the other side of the car. She realizes something's up after she mentions that her client book is missing, and Scotty looks excited about that. They pull up to a club in a limousine, and Hillary still hasn't gathered that there might be a surprise set up for her. <laughs> It's like, oh, we picked you up in a limousine and brought you to a fancy club for no reason. I'm not sure why this escort wasn't more suspicious about Scotty wanting to introduce his son to his prostitute friend. <laughs> it turns out that Scotty has invited every client from her book to a luncheon at $250 a plate to raise money for her retirement. I don't know what inspires this scene in a person's head. And I don't know what part it plays in the overall story of the film other than introducing this Hillary character. I have so many questions. Like, why would everybody in the room want to know everybody else that I don't, their prostitute has yeah. slept with? How did he decode her book? She said it was all coded so that yeah. nobody could read it. And like, what? what? 
if she's a high-end escort, does she really need help with retirement? <laughs> like, well, she did happening? make a comment in the car that she had plans for some kind of retirement that were falling apart or something mm. like that, that she wanted to raise money. But it's basically just a scene about a shitty dad with a blood disorder helping a prostitute retire. And who in their right mind would accept an invitation to a $250 a plate dinner with a hundred of their Eskimo brothers? <laughs> I don't know why these people would go to the same place. They're probably also largely gross people in yeah. general yeah. that she doesn't want to see for free at an event. Everyone applauds her arrival. And in the back of the room, Judd is disappointed, bored. I don't know. He leaves. Uh, he just kind of makes an uncomfortable face and leaves. Scotty introduces a second speaker and then he leaves to catch up with Judd. Today is the last day of this photography exhibition and Judd wants to catch it before it closes. His dad is, again, just awkward and uncomfortable and offers to take his son to a strip club instead. I don't understand this character. Yeah. Like, I get that you're trying to be like, oh, one of them's wacky and the other one's straight laced. And it's like, yeah, but this is too wacky for mm -hmm. a dad. Like, you're exaggerating the character so much that he's not a real person anymore. Well, I, I think it's a combination of this is all he knows. Yeah. And he also might be just trying to be like, look how cool of a dad I am. I'm willing to take my son to the places that no one yeah. would ever take their son. But he hasn't noticed that his son hasn't reacted to this yet in 20-something yeah. years. Well, also, I mean, I don't know if this is the character, but it's certainly how Robbie Benson is playing him, that he seems almost like Asperger's-y. I don't know. They, they both seem out of touch. Like, they, they don't, they're not good at reading signals. Mm. There's definitely communication issues. Scotty and Judd agree to meet up later. Scotty calls Sally from a phone at the luncheon to suggest that she find Judd at the museum for a good time. Apparently, this girl never has anything better to do than exactly what Scotty wants her to do. Well, she's recovering from a surgery, so right. maybe she took time off of her work. Yeah. She finds him taking pictures of pictures, and then we cut immediately to them picnicking outside the museum. Suddenly, it's pouring on their picnic, and they collect everything to run to the car. We cut to them resetting the picnic in the living room at Scotty's place. Judd tells Sally about his inexperience with women and blames it on his introvertedness and a childhood stutter that he has overcome. Sally calls Judd out for avoiding personal questions and then asks for a bite of his pickle. He offers her a second pickle and she says, You can have the whole pickle. No, just a bite. There. <coughs> now we share a pickle. Yes. <laughs> I noticed that. <laughs> so now we know each other a lot better. And you can tell me anything you want. If she was trying to be sexy here, I don't think it worked. It reminded me of the line in Motel Hell when he said, How would you like it if uh, someday I taught you the ancient art of meat smoking? <laughs> Judd then tells her about his terrible relationship with his father. Just then, Scotty gets home and pretends that this is the third or fourth time that he's walked in on his son with a date, but she knows that he's lying because he told her to be here, so this is just for Judd's benefit mm -hmm. to think my father's being supportive by pretending that I'm a ladies' man, Yeah, I guess. He introduces himself to Sally as Judd's teenage father, which I don't know if he means that he's a teenager now <laughs> <laughs> or that he was when Judd was born. She invites Judd's father, the man who earlier this week she tried to have sex with, to join them for a picnic in his own living room. She offers to mix them some drinks and then pulls on the secret book to reveal the bar, but also reveal that she's been here before and likely drank with Scotty in the past. Judd pretends that he knew the whole time that his father set this date up, and Scotty leaves in the ensuing awkwardness of the moment. I don't want him pimping for me. If he's a pimp, what does that make me? Well, at the very least, it makes you a girl who is on call to date whoever this guy says, which is weird. <laughs> Maybe an escort to be nice, mm. but she storms out. Suddenly, Scotty returns for his most annoying moment of the film in a full-body chicken costume, and he just makes ridiculous chicken sounds. <laughs> Wah, 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 wah. 
but it works. Judd laughs. Yeah. At first, Judd reacts terrified, like he's never seen this costume before, and there aren't pictures of it all over the house. I I would also be terrified, even if this was something my father did to me with me as a child. If yeah. he all of a sudden boisterously and excitedly came in at, out of nowhere with yeah. that costume, I'd be like, "No, this isn't. This is wrong. This I need to call wrong. the police." You I'm, need to go to a hospital. I'm curious if it was Jack Lemmon in the costume. I think the whole time it was because it is an extreme performance. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it is Jack Lemmon because he's he's operating at you know he's he's up at eleven for this whole movie. Yeah. But uh, at first he's terrified and then he laughs even though this is not a person. Even if you liked your father, you would not laugh at this joke. There, there's no way that he would find this amusing. And the chicken costume lays an egg on the couch before. He collapses on the floor. Scotty seems relieved that Judd is even capable of laughing anymore. They sit across from each other, and Judd starts airing some grievances finally. He wants to know why his father never spoke with him when he and his mother separated. He just woke up one day and he was gone, and Scotty's really not prepared to answer the question, and stumbles through a sort of half apology on his way to recommending that Judd reach back out to Sally to try and salvage things, even though their, like, hour-long relationship was funded on his father sleeping with her first and then getting her to date Judd as a favor. And Judd's like, you're right. I should definitely try and get back together with that girl. Scotty sits down at the piano and Judd tells him, you know, I found some of your old stories in a drawer recently and I actually really enjoyed them. It seems that Judd, like his mother, believed in Scotty's potential more than Scotty did. He's very self-deprecating about his work and he talks through his short writing career. I guess he got work in Hollywood, but the screenwriting scene was kind of gross and shallow, and so he transitioned to producing, which is a weird choice if you think screenwriting is shallow. <laughs> so I guess he's a producer? Yeah. He's either an agent or a producer, or maybe he's a little bit of both. I think he's a little of both. Judd asks his father if it bothers him that he has no accomplishments he can take pride in, and Scotty hits him with an appropriate zinger for the question. Well, I'd always hoped that might be you, son. We cut to the next day, maybe a couple days, and Judd is knocking on Sally's door while balancing on a tricycle. When she answers the door, we get a high angle shot of him in a noose hanging from a pipe in her hallway, threatening to hang himself as a hilarious joke if she won't forgive him and join him for another date. I don't understand any of this. Yeah, I don't either. Because like, it doesn't seem like it's in his character. Correct. Mm. Because... He does a lot of stuff where he's like channeling the Jack Lemon character because he's trying to be like his dad. I guess. Maybe and I think this, this is, is him, one of those moments. Him failing to try to be goofy, I guess. Yeah. I like don't his know. dad. <laughs> but also, what I could is... see Jack Lemon's character in this movie doing this exact move. Maybe. What does he have to be sorry about? Nothing. He has nothing they, to be sorry about. She and his father conspired against him to embarrass him, basically. I know. I don't know why he's trying to make amends at all. Yeah, he shouldn't even be pursuing this person because as far as he knows, this is another escort that his father represents as an agent for a major talent agency. Every time this happens in one of these movies, I wish that the girl would just close the door and lock it because this is a shitty thing to do to a person and suicide is not a funny prank that you play. We're going to get another scene like this next year with Jack Lemon, but this time hanging himself from a pipe in the movie Buddy Buddy, where I think the the joke is that the pipe breaks and then he ends up drenched in the water at the end of it. it, it the, like literally the entire trailer on YouTube is just Jack Lemon trying to hang himself from a pipe and then getting drenched in water. Instead, Sally is quick to forgive him, and when he kicks the tricycle away, she helps him down without strangling himself. She invites him into the apartment and then drags him by the noose into her place. We cut to Scotty sitting at a table playing poker. Gladys Petrelli shows up to drag him out of the room. She's obviously been trying to reach him for a while. She left messages at his work and she's not happy about his avoiding her. She walks him through the building away from where the guys are playing and lectures him the whole time about the necessity to begin treatment as soon as possible. Scotty jokes around with her for a while, but eventually asks some genuine questions about the life that he can expect if he survives treatment, and he also admits to her that he's terrified, presumably of not surviving the treatment. Back at his home, we see Scotty put in a call to Lou Daniel's office. He leaves a message that might be a joke. I, I don't know. He says, 
that it's about a morals, uh, a, an ethical trial coming up. And he says that there were triplets, but that one of them changed her story, but two of them are still accusing him of crimes. Yeah, hi there. How are you? I'd like to speak to a Mr. Lou Daniels, please. I don't know what room number. And it, hmm? He's not going to be back to, uh, a message? Uh, yeah, just tell him his lawyer called about the morals charges. Uh, wait a minute. Operator? Yeah, the, yeah. There's no sense keeping the poor man in suspense. Tell him one of the triplets dropped the charges. The other two are still sticking to this story. He's got my number. I think it's just he's making a risque joke so that his friend will call him back right away. But it might also be a real problem that his friend is having. I don't know. It's not clear. After he hangs up the phone, we get a glimpse of how the illness is affecting his brain. He's doing bits by himself. First, he pretends that he's about to cause an explosion by dropping a cigar into a nearly empty glass of liquor. Oh, for God, I'm going around the bend, for God's sake. I'm going around the bend. I'm doing bits. Nobody's here to see him. The doorbell rings, and he goes completely insane. Yeah. Quickly, everybody back into your clothes. Let go of my leg, you silly mad goose, you. I'm coming. Gertrude, I'm from under the organ, but she is up. Everybody acts normal. He pulls his pants down to answer the door, and I assumed he was about to be driven directly to a hospital. This is the stagiest acting we get from Lemon for the whole movie, and I wonder why Bob Clark let him do this on film, because this is not movie acting. Yeah. I I don't know. I would disagree. I think there's a couple other moments that stand out. I mean the strikingly. chicken the chicken stuff is crazy too. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, even in terms of just I, this whole this whole movie feels like it takes place on a stage to me. I it think, should have just been it's just stay to play. Yeah. But it's super, super talky and there is not a lot of action and, and plot that progresses forward. Like it's it's just a bunch of it could it could have been room a, talking a T V movie or miniseries type thing too. It didn't need to be a feature film in theaters. Lee Remick, as his wife or ex wife Maggie, comes inside and pretends like it's a joke that she's in on when any normal person would be very concerned for this man. We cut to Judd and Sally on a date at a roller rink, and she's picking on him for wearing so much protective gear. Scotty and Maggie go out for dinner together, and she informs him of some of his tells from when they were younger. Did I ever tell you how I knew when you were cheating on me? You can't believe that. Ugh. You always switched your drink to the one the woman drank. We cut back to Sally and Judd's date, and it seems like Judd is trying his hand at being obnoxiously free-spirited like his father again. He hired a coachman to take them on a carriage ride, even though it's pouring out. But Sally's totally into it because... For some reason, she likes these kinds of guys. Scotty and Maggie get home, and she asks if he wants to talk about his condition, if that will help in any way. He does share with her some of his internal thoughts, that he was never scared of death until someone gave him a timeline. He thought that knowing this would give him some kind of closure or unlock some grand understanding of his life, but he's still just as confused as he ever was. Then he tells her the worst part. When a friend dies, you lose a friend. When you die, you lose all your friends. He switches again to his manic comedian mode and then tells her a quote-unquote funny story about a time in Judd's childhood where he brought him to a fish farm to go fishing, but he left Judd there by himself for two and a half hours so he could play cards next door. And when he came back, Judd had caught 28 trout that cost 10 bucks each. Scotty finally has a full breakdown in his chair and Maggie crosses the room, to kiss him passionately. Judd comes home late and tells Scotty that Sally threw him out after their date because of she's still recovering for, from an appendectomy, obviously, and they're having breakfast in the morning. But suddenly, Maggie is coming down the stairs and very unambiguously hints at what just happened between them. Mom, what? Scotty, I can't find my skirt. I don't know what you tore off me in the heat of passion down there. Judd is obviously very upset to find her here since he has a stepfather who presumably treats him better than Scotty does, and who his mother should be loyal to. Judd is so furious to find them back together that his stutter comes back. I don't understand the situation. Oh, I think I've always understood the situation. I have a totally amoral, irresponsible, selfish child for a father who doesn't care who he hurts as long as he gets his own way. My God, Judd, we can handle the situation, but... Oh, how are we going to handle it? Are you going to climb in your chicken costume? My God! How do you live with yourself? 
Judd moves to collect his things and leave the home. Maggie follows him upstairs, and he chews her out before leaving. I thought you hated him! Oh, would you grow up? I was grown up when I was eight years old. Before Judd can leave the house, Maggie breaks it to her son that Scotty is sick and may be dying soon. Obviously, this is a lot for Judd to take in, but it's not enough to change his mind about leaving right now. The next morning, Maggie wakes up on Scotty's couch, and they chat amicably. They notice Judd's things are here, meaning that he hasn't left, so I guess he went out and then just came back and stayed for the night. Scotty asks Maggie if she told him that he's dying, and she lies that she hasn't yet because she thought it should be his decision. Scotty's still angry at his son for being upset at things that a normal person would be upset about. <laughs> he's, he's not remembering that this kid didn't know during the during their argument that he was dying, so yeah. he thinks these parents just did a shitty thing together, and he has every right to be angry about that. He makes a joke about how he wishes he could just get rid of Judd. I had an aunt once who said children ought to be like waffles. You should be able to throw the first one out. I'm assuming this is an 80s joke because in the present, we do not waste our waffles. <laughs> and there is no logic to this practice. <laughs> but I, okay. Is this a freezer waffle thing, you think? No. Like the no. One that's no, this is homemade waffles and a waffle iron. Okay, waffles aside. Okay. <laughs> waffles Fine, aside. I guess we're not going to talk waffles. <laughs> no, we're not talking waffles. Maybe we will. I'm waffling on it. You're fired. It's good. Uh he like the whole point of this i just like i'm so frustrated with this character because the whole point of this having your son stay at your house and and be with you for this this time is because you want good memories you want good memories you want to get closer you want to understand each other you want to make up for lost time why would you say such a shitty thing even if it's supposed to be a joke yeah like you're hiding it under the guise of a joke but you just said a really shitty yeah, thing you, to your kid. you wish that you could push a button and negate your son yeah that's just horrible like yeah. i don't get why you would even joke about such a thing yeah and the same thing for waffles though like <laughs> let's get back on the waffle uh front no. because waffles are delicious you eat the first one well, you don't throw it away you're saying this is a gr this is griddle waffles Walk, griddle waffles that's what the, the whatever waffles, you call the yeah. thing isn't like it a, a griddle that you make a waffle a waffle iron isn't it a griddle no griddles are big flat pieces of, of, of metal with a waffle shape on them no there's no <laughs> waffle shape on them they're just flat that's what you make pancakes on or waffles no. waffles are just pancakes with a syrup trap mitch hedberg are we getting very <laughs> controversial here <laughs> I never waste a waffle. I've never done it in this house. All good. right, let's move on. <laughs> Scotty and Maggie have another sweet moment as she tries to find a way to say goodbye, suspecting there's a chance, however slim, that they won't see each other again. As she walks out, she sees Judd across the street waiting for her to be gone. If he was actually trying to do this in secret, he picked a weird place to stand, yeah. so he must have wanted her to know that he was going to do this. He asks what her plan is with regard to her current husband, his stepfather, and she says, you know what, I think you'd understand, but I might not even tell him, and it's none of your business. Bye. Judd heads into the house and starts another fight with his father. The kid is very passive-aggressive, and the dad is super non-committal again, so no new ground is covered. The doorbell rings, and Sally comes in with groceries to make breakfast. Seconds later, Gladys is at the door, and Scotty walks her to another room so they can chat in private. She reminds him that he needs to come with her to the hospital and begin treatment, and he tells her that he has no interest in pursuing treatment, that it's his life and his choice. He talks to her about a friend who got sick and did not make a pleasant recovery. He was not the same person when he came out of the hospital, and he's worried that he will come back changed. She tells him that he's not guaranteed to come back an invalid or anything, and it would at least give him more time, but Scotty points out that he doesn't need more time because he's not on the verge of any great accomplishment. What about your son? Oh, Jesus, let me tell you something, baby. Uh, every now and then, Gladys, you just have to cut your losses and run. His point being that extra time would only allow him to be a worse father to the kid. Scotty refuses treatment one final time and kisses her on the forehead before Gladys leaves. He also makes a reference to Gladys... Uh, about possibly giving him some medications or morphine to kill right. himself. Yeah, because she says, well, how are you going to deal with the end? And he's like, I was hoping you could give me something to take care of that. 
Um, but she's that that's like the last straw for her. That's mm-hmm. when she walks out. But this is also a thing that physicians have done. I don't know if that was happening in the 80s. I mean, I don't think Kevorkian assisted invented, suicide? yeah, assisted suicide. Oh, no, I mean, I, I don't think that that's anything new. Yeah, but um, she seems like insulted that he would even suggest it. Well, when, I think... I well, think, she's a doctor. Yeah, I think that a lot of doctors would be. So is Dr. Kevorkian, though. My point is that <laughs> it's a thing that doctors have provided, and she's acting like it's completely inappropriate for him to, him to even suggest it. And it's like, mm, no. Well, I mean... I think that a lot of doctors would be insulted by that. I mean, they have their oath that, you know, do but no I, harm. But I feel like if you disagree with that practice, that what a doctor should do is say, I don't do that. You can look elsewhere if that's what you're looking for. I don't do that personally. But you don't just go like, oh, well, you're an asshole. How dare you say that to me? That's that's how it feels when she just turns around and walks away from him. I mean, they're friends too. So I guess, it's got yeah. another level to it. We see Gladys make an illegal U-turn and park next to a fire hydrant before running into the corner store to catch Judd with Sally and let him know everything that she knows. But he already knows it. Yeah. And this whole scene didn't need to happen. I, I don't know what she told him because it's another scene where information it's muted, is being yeah. related. But but what could she have told him? That It looks like she just walked in and said, hey, your father's dying. And he said, yeah, I already know that. Someone already told me that. Unless she's telling him that he's going to be in a lot of pain and suffer when he dies. But since we don't hear it, yep, that extra detail isn't isn't helpful. Sally asks for some explanation of what the doctor just told him, and he doesn't want to tell her what's going on. He's able to at least confess that he caught his parents together last night, but he doesn't tell her the whole story, and he doesn't explain anything about why a doctor would come and bother him in a corner store about it. Sally doesn't see what Judd's problem is with his father and keeps belittling him. She tells him that he needs to be more accepting of his father's flaws because everyone's human. And then she hands him all the stuff they bought and says, bye, because she's not willing to accept his flaws. (laughs) Judd steps into his father's place and starts poking at the piano a little bit before his temper gets the better of him and he just starts slamming on the keys hard. Scotty's coworker Lou sneaks up on him to surprise him lou wants to chat with judd about his father somehow lou knows everything that went on maybe petrelli got a hold of him too but we don't see that happen nope and i don't think that scotty would tell lou about it because he's been lying to him about it so far but he wants scotty to go to the hospital because he lost a wife five years ago and he understands the purpose of fighting this illness and he tries to talk judd into cooperating with him judd says you know what I'm not going to do that. I respect my father's decision not to go to the hospital. And Lou points out, well, you know, you haven't respected your father at all so far. It's interesting that you chose this to suddenly respect what your father cares about. While Lou continues to convince Judd that his father is worth saving, we hear a pop inside and assume that Scotty has just shot himself in the head. Cheers, 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 cheers. Jesus, Scotty. What's the matter with you? You look a little odd to me, pal. Well, I always look this way when my heart stops. What the hell are you doing, Scotty? Holding a bottle of champagne. I find champagne and orange juice makes breakfast a little more yeah. festive. They find him coming out of the kitchen with a bottle of champagne bubbling over, which is a joke that also appears in 1960's The Apartment, also starring Jack Lemmon. He's planning on mimosas for breakfast. Weirdly, Judd tells his father that he heard the news from Gladys before admitting that his mother told him last night. It seems pointless to mention both unless he's just trying to throw his mother under the bus for cheating on his stepfather. Scotty is obviously angry with Maggie for having spilled the beans that he's dying. But it wouldn't have mattered because Gladys Because Gladys told him also. (laughs) The two of them launch into another fight, the gist being that Judd intends to see his father get better because he owes Judd. His father owes it to him to fight this and survive it. Scotty tries to turn it around on Judd. Where were you when I needed you? What? Jesus, I guess there's no two-way street, is there? Where the hell were you when I was in the middle of the city knocking my ass off looking for a job? Where were you? I don't understand his point here at all. Yeah, what? what? He seems to be completely losing the thread of the argument. Where have you been for two solid years, kid? Isn't that funny? I haven't seen you rushing madly to keep your old man company, I'll tell you. You never insisted that I come. It was your choice. You shouldn't have given me a choice. It's rare for me to think that both people arguing are in the wrong. Yeah. (laughs) But Jack Lemmon's argument boils down to, I shouldn't have had to be your father because I didn't feel like it. And Judd's point seems to be like, 
You should have forced me to love you even if I didn't. I'm just so bothered by his lack of understanding uh, like which one duties no i mean oh yeah the yeah. Par- the parental stuff is a yeah, problem I'm yeah i'm just like what I, do you- <sighs> you're mad at your son for not getting you a job when yeah. he was a child what is your point I don't, yeah like none none of his arguments make sense and he just says and does really shitty things to his kid and like and judd's and argument this is his attempt at making it better yeah and and judd's <laughs> argument is is you were a terrible father to me and that's why I don't see you anymore. And then his dad says, well, why why don't you want to see me? And then he said, you should force me to against my will, dad. Why don't you force me to come see you so that I'll love you more? Because it's working so well this week. The scene ends with probably the harshest line of dialogue that either of them will say to each other. Let's just say that I'm not the father that you always wanted. All right. Has it occurred to you? That you are not the son that I always wanted. This is where their relationship as father and son should have ended. Yeah. He should have gotten on a plane and flown away and taught school somewhere. They're both narcissists. They don't care about each other. They're both victims in this relationship. And this should be the last time they talk to each other. Yeah. As they break off the conversation, Judd shouts, Why don't you just go fuck yourself? Which sounds the most like Disney's The Beast out of any of his line reads (laughs) in this film. Scotty and Lou leave together to have breakfast somewhere near Happy Faces, and upstairs, Judd is destroying things in anger. He's shouting at his candelabras and clocks. (laughs) (laughs) He punches that poor picture frame. Yeah. He throws a dresser down the stairs and crushes a townsperson. I told you before that... I know. That dresser killed a person in Beauty and the Beast. I, I know you said that. Out the window, Judd sees them hailing a taxi, and he decides to follow them. Here's where I started to get worried that Judd was about to wear this stupid chicken suit out to the restaurant with them, but when we see him following them, luckily he's not. Judd has packed up everything that Scotty will need at the hospital, and he walks in on the breakfast between his father and his father's coworker, and he informs Scotty that they're headed to the hospital. We need some time. Why? Because I'm not ready to cry over you yet. I think this all could have been very powerful if they had played it naturally, but because everything is so stagey, it really saps all the emotion from the scene. We cut to a montage of photographs of Scotty being admitted to a hospital, being treated, being sick, getting better, eventually being released, and holy shit, there's another fucking half hour to this movie. I- yeah yeah I, like, I don't know which made me more angry the montage of pictures or the next half an hour <laughs> that that would have been the most interesting part of the movie if we'd told that story yeah but we didn't so that part was just pictures and well, then that was the moment that that was their time like the whole point of this movie the whole point of this movie is to reconnect as father yeah, and son to repair mm-hmm. this relationship and 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 the thing that was going to do that was going to be breaking down Jack Lemon's like pride and and bringing him back down to a human level and connecting with his son and like, we get one shot <laughs> of him in the hospital with Judd sleeping in the chair next to him and coming to check on his father in the middle of the night. And that's the most we get of this entire experience. The, the most formative experience in their relationship as yeah. father and son. Well, and half the pictures of this is just like joking around with hospital staff. Yeah, he's like, being the same the sh- asshole he is for is the whole rest of the movie. Us? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know we established that his son is somewhat of a photographer, but none of these photos seem like... What his son would have taken. Yeah. No, he would have done like artsier photos that showed the the reality of the situation he wouldn't let his father pose with nine nurses Mm -hmm. and and if it's supposed to be him taking those pictures and sort of coming to an under a better understanding of what of who his father is again i don't think that this which he claims later that's a claim he makes i know but i don't think that this montage accomplishes that i agree but there's no reason the film doesn't just end with this montage. If we're not going to see what happened to the hospital, at least end the film with him being... Can't we just have a picture of an empty bed yeah. and be done with it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At the end of this montage, we learn that this is a slideshow presentation that Judd is putting together. Again, perfect moment to end the film with this just being for his funeral. Right. right. And it turns yeah. out That's that what I thought it was. this attempt at saving his life didn't pay off, but it fixed their relationship. Mm-hmm. End of the movie. That would have been great. But it turns out that's not what happened. He's fine. He survived and he's totally in remission. Everything's great. 
Sally walks into this theater where they're presenting this slideshow just by chance, and they start chatting for the first time in apparently several months. Judd informs Sally that he's planning a surprise birthday party for Scotty, and she's like, oh, that's so wonderful. That's, that's a great idea. Judd brings Sally home, and Scotty asks them multiple times what day it is to nudge them into realizing that it's his birthday, but they both play dumb. When they don't react to his birthday hints, Scotty seems legitimately depressed, and they just let him get sadder and sadder for this whole scene. I thought, what a horrible twist of a movie. Yeah, you hear that it, he cracks another champagne, and or, they're like, oh, champagne. No, well, no, I thought more that he was just going to like have a heart attack or something, and, uh, yeah. like, that no one, and he'll, his dying moment will be that no one remembered his birthday. Yeah. What if what if they hear him pop champagne and they all bring champagne glasses in and he's just dead on the floor? <laughs> <laughs> I heard a gunshot, but it's weird that he hanged himself. Yeah. Where, where did the gunshot <laughs> That's come strange. from? Lou walks in and tells the kids that he's collected 50 people from the airport today and stashed them in hotels all over town. Sally pretends that she has to leave early to head to some Shriners event because she's a model. Scotty assumes that his phone is broken since nobody has called with any birthday wishes. Lastly, Judd leaves and says that he's catching the red eye out of town tonight. Lou says, it's probably time for me to get going, and he asks how Scotty's doing. You know, I think we started as the odd couple, and we're turning into the Sunshine Boys, which are both adapted from the works of Neil Simon, who just wrote Seems Like Old Times for us, and both star Walter Matthau, though only odd couple stars Jack Lemmon. Lou says he has to head into work, and left alone again, Scotty literally calls the phone company to see if anything's wrong with his phone, since he's not getting calls from people. But the call is interrupted by another ringing at the doorbell. It's a woman pretending to be a British nurse. Is she doing yeah. like a Cockney I accent? I don't know. It's a weird, weird accent. It sounds Scottish for like two words. She says she's here on orders from Gladys Petrelli. He tells her that he's not sick anymore, and this must be a mistake, and she starts to have a meltdown because she's screwed up somehow and she's sure to get fired for this. He fixes her a drink to calm her down, and he tells her that it's his birthday and that everyone forgot. She feels terrible for him and tries to cheer him up by doing a little strip dance. And when she whips her boobs out, he stares them down to suddenly recognize them as Hillary's boobs the girl whose party he planned earlier in the film. I'm not sure that that whole scene was necessary to set this moment up, though. We could lose the Hillary character completely and have a slightly less confusing movie. No, 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 it's perfect. I, I guess we needed boobs, because otherwise people would be like, why did I buy the ticket? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> if I don't see boobs. <laughs> but, like, this is... I, I assume that they are close friends. He set up this crazy yeah. dinner thing in her honor, and he Did doesn't recognize, recognize her. her face. He only recognized her yeah. boobs. Like, what mm -hmm. an asshole. Yeah. Judd, Sally, and Lou all come back and collect Scotty for the rest of his birthday festivities. Before they leave Scotty's place, though, Hillary gives him a very heavy-handed speech about how great it is that he treats everyone like equals, whether they're his family or friends or just general <laughs> acquaintances or just fucking people on it's the like street. It's like, job. Yeah. You treat everyone like shit. Yeah. <laughs> There's literally no way this could have been perceived as a compliment, but they're playing it off like, oh, she meant to be nice, but accidentally it sounded terrible. It's like, no, it just straight sounded terrible the whole time. There's, She was trying to make a point, I thought. I thought she was saying this specifically to pick on his shitty fatherness. But either way, it works. It hurts him. After she leaves, Judd admits that what she said is true and that he never wanted anything more than to be a priority in his father's life, but it never happened. He says that for a while he wanted to be exactly like his father, but he realized he couldn't live up to his father. And Scotty says, don't worry, you're exactly like me not in the good ways where I'm like entertaining or people want to be around me, but you're just like me and that you refuse to make emotional commitments to anyone. And it's going to be a problem for your whole life. But uh, he says, don't worry, you're young. You can fix this. They head out to the party together. Apparently they spent a bunch of money on an animated billboard that says tribute to Scotty Templeton. The crowd at the party is like twice as big as Hillary's crowd. They have a full theater booked. And there's a long line of speakers who take the stage to roast him. Scotty's grinning through all of it, but we're seeing a montage of him arguing with Gladys and Maggie 
and Judd in his head. And I don't know if he's hearing anything that's being said on stage that's mm-hmm. complimentary. He's just thinking about all the angry conversations he's had over the last week. Scotty is invited on stage and starts doing a bad stand-up bit about an aunt that he had that, what did she think she was? A poached egg. She thought she was a poached egg and she carried toast with her everywhere. Yeah. And it's... people couldn't step on the toast. And he's like, that's exactly a perfect metaphor for me <laughs> and how I've been for this whole movie. I don't let people step on my toast. And it's like, this, this was a last minute, like, I need to think of a metaphor to close this movie out. Yeah, it's it's a very confusing speech that he's giving here. Yeah, it's a jumbled metaphor. But it's all getting applause. They're very, they're, the, the whole crowd is really digging this whole poached egg joke. He starts to get more genuine with the crowd and he sounds on the verge of tears and even almost confused about where he is. Like they're worried medically for him because he's losing the thread. He announces to the group that he would like to speak to his son and we spend a weirdly long time not showing the son and having the son stand up. So here, okay, here's what I think is happening in this scene. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say in the play version of this, he's on the stage alone speaking to the audience as if the they are his out. friends yeah. and the ki- and 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 he, and his son isn't responding for a while and, and you're worried that he's been left he, behind and he's worried that he's gone or they're never going to reconcile and then he comes out through the audience and this is like that moment that mm-hmm. feels really deep but it just does not have that kind of impact when no. we're watching it play out in a theater and you're watching the audience react to it cause, and and you're not having those feelings it just it feels very stilted and weird and i i mean no, nothing he's saying is making sense anyways but yeah. like i just don't think it has the same kind of emotional impact it would have in a, in a theater setting but in his sort of monologue here as he's talking to his son but not directly with his son because his son hasn't shown up yet he's telling him that if there's one thing he could pass along that that something for his son to inherit it would be passion uh, to the ability to have passion for something in your life because but that's not even really something he can pass along because he doesn't he, have well, it and yeah. he admits here i think essentially that he didn't have passion right but that's like saying like me saying to addy the one thing i want you to have for my collection is the hope diamond and it's like you don't dad you don't have that that's at the <laughs> that's at the museum well i think he's trying he, he he's not saying it well he's like i want to give you advice To do the thing that I never did. Right. But I don't think that's enough. Like, his wife has been telling him to have passion for 20 years. Yeah. And he doesn't have passion yet. At the end of the speech, Scotty isn't sure how to get off stage when suddenly Judd is shouting to him from the audience. What about that uh, girl you had in Pennsylvania? Who? What about that girl you had in Pennsylvania? eerie well i have to admit she was a little weird the two of them do the whole bit that they've had memorized since judd's childhood but now judd gets to do the punchlines, and scotty is having to play the straight man which is tripping him up more than it should yeah. for a guy with his showmanship and uh what about your brother in alaska no no of course i know he's my uncle Scotty calls Judd on stage to give him a kiss on the cheek and then turns his head just before to kiss his son on the lips and they hug each other tight. As they're walking off stage, Scotty drops his pants to the floor for another big laugh from the audience and we freeze frame on them at the edge of the stage with his pants around his ankles and he seems like the same guy that we started the movie with but with a son that has basically come to terms with who his dad is. And that's the end of our film. We didn't even get the satisfaction of having him die. <laughs> he really should have been, that the slideshow should have I been know, I know. he's dead. <laughs> I know. You, you know what movie that does this way better is Royal Tenenbaums. I was going to say a different Bill Murray movie, uh the one with Melissa McCarthy where he's the asshole in the oh, neighborhood. Oh, St. Vincent? Vincent? Yeah. 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 But yeah, they those are both better examples of this because they don't because they, they nail the ending and they also feel like a a real father. Mm-hmm. Which is weird because 
Wes Anderson basically directs like cartoons. Like his movies are are basically cartoons, but they feel like more well-rounded characters than anyone in this movie. Right. Our director here was Bob Clark, which surprises me. Uh, before this, he did Black Christmas, and after this, he'll do a couple Porky's movies, a Christmas Story, a, and then a couple Baby Geniuses movies. So it's like hit and miss. But I I have a hard time reconciling a Christmas Story and this coming from the same director because one is so capably handled, mm-hmm. and it's it's even the you can see how much of it is the director's work. I think that this suffered from being a recreation of this of the stage production yes. so much i think it was trying to be as it, accurate it as was possible. right exactly and yeah i'm saying like not only did jack lemon perform the same way as he did on stage which really doesn't do the movie justice but i think that whoever saw this and said this needs to be a movie fell in love with the stage play and didn't understand what needed to be fixed to make it a movie. This is why we've been having adapted by credits before the screenplay credits in previous plays that were adapted to film this year. We keep saying, Oh, what does adapted mean? If it was a play and then it's a, and then it's a movie, then there's just a screenwriter. And it's like, there's someone else's job in the, in the middle to change this from being a stage production to being a movie because it needs massive adjustments. But uh, Bob Clark and his youngest son were struck and killed in a head-on collision with a drunk driver on PCH in 2007. Uh, the playwright slash screenwriter, he did both, Bernard Slade, wrote 17 episodes of Bewitched. He also wrote plays and adapted screenplays for Same Time Next Year and Romantic Comedy. So the, so the screenwriter and the, and, the, and the playwright are the same guy. So yes. He, he wrote the plays and the screenplays adapted from his own plays. Right. But for those two movies does he have does he have other screenwriting credits not screenwriting alone not screenwriting his alone. screenwriting credits right. are for plays that he wrote and adapted yeah. himself so he probably just doesn't even understand the, the what is needed i wouldn't doubt that we would run into the same problems in both of those movies yeah. and we'll be getting to them uh jack lemon played scotty templeton he was cc baxter in the apartment he's felix unger in the odd couple movies uh, he's Jerry slash Daphne in Some Like It Hot. He's also in Glengarry Glen Ross, Grumpier Old Men. We last saw him in our Patreon review of the original Out of Towners. At some point in his career, Lemon said that this was his favorite character to play. I'm guessing that point was during a press release for this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Robbie Benson played Judd Templeton. He directed six episodes of Friends. We saw him last in Die Laughing, but he is best known for providing the voice of the Beast in Disney's Beauty and the Beast. Oddly enough, also not related to Jody Benson, who voices a different royalty yeah, uh, in Disney. Yeah, the Ariel. It's Ariel, yeah. yeah. Lee Remick played Maggie Stratton. She was Laura Mannion in Anatomy of a Murder. She was previously Jack Lemmon's wife in Days of Wine and Roses. She's also in The Omen, but we saw her last in The Competition, where she played Amy Irving's piano coach. Colleen Dewhurst played Gladys Petrelli. She has four Emmys from a long television acting career, but she's also Kate in The Cowboys and Henrietta Dodd in The Dead Zone. John Marley played Lou Daniels. He was Phil in Love Story. He's Frankie Ballou in Cat Ballou, and he's Jack Waltz in The Godfather, the studio head who refuses to hire Johnny Fontaine, telling Tom Hagen, a man in my position can't afford to be made to look ridiculous and changes his tone when he awakes the following morning with the head of his prized racehorse in his bed. Um, I wanted to add a credit to uh, Dewhurst. Yep. Uh, Colleen Dewhurst also provided the voice of Satan <laughs> in it, The Exorcist 3. Really? Um, Interesting. That, that, that is who is cr- uh, credited as uncredited voice of Satan. Interesting. That's cool. Kim Cattrall played Sally Haynes. She's Lieutenant Valeris in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. Mm -hmm. She's also a total Samantha on HBO's Sex and the City. (laughs) But to me, she will always be Gracie Law from John Carpenter's Big Trouble in Little China. She will work again with director Bob Clark in Porky's, Turk 182, and the first Baby Geniuses movie. Not going to mention Mannequin? Is she in the first one or the second one? 
Second one, Mannequin 2. Okay. Man- uh, on the move. On the move, <laughs> yeah. Because in the first one, they don't move. They're just mannequins. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely not true. Did Stuart Raffle direct both of those? Uh, I know he did the first one. I want to do like a, just a raffle-thon. What? Just Stuart Raffle movies. Mac and Me, Tammy and the T-Rex, Mannequin, can we put, Ice Pirates. Can we put all of them into like a big tourney thing and just do like... A, a ball comes out it's like a, it's a raffle. A raffle raffle. A raffle raffle. <laughs> oh, she was? No, <laughs> she was it. in the first Mannequin. I was wrong. I couldn't remember. Maybe she's not in Mannequin 2. I don't think it's the same actress for both movies. Yeah, so she's not in Mannequin 2. But she is in Mannequin 1. All right. Not on the move, they called it. Mannequin 1, not on the move. It's <laughs> <laughs> a weird poster. Gail Garnett played Hillary. She has a lot of soundtrack credits for her 66 hit song, We'll Sing in the Sunshine, which she wrote and performed on Hollywood A Go Go, Bandstand, The Sunny and Cher Show, and was also featured in an episode of The Muppet Show, as well as more recently in Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. She also plays Aunt Lexi in My Big Fat Greek Wedding, Francesca, in Mad Monster Party, which character is that? Yeah, so Francesca is the um, assistant to Frankenstein. She's she's like the only human among all the monsters. Oh, okay. But um, there's actually another connection that I wanted to bring up between, because I recognized her voice that I was looking up her role in Mad Monster Party, and uh, and I thought it was really interesting. She's got such an iconic voice. Like I think it's really like Kathy Moriarty or Kathleen Turner like. Yeah. Um so I was like, "Oh yeah, Francesca." And um at the end of that movie, at the end of Mad Monster Party. At the Party? end of Mad Monster Party, there's a connection back. So, uh as they're like fleeing the island, uh Francesca is fleeing with uh Frankenstein's nephew or whatever his some some other relationship with Frankenstein, they fell in love and they're fleeing the island and uh and then it, it sort of, sorry, I'm about to spoil Mad Monster Party for everyone. <laughs> uh, turns out that Francesca's actually a robot. And uh, and and then Felix, the nephew's like, well, you know, none of us are perfect, uh, which is a nod to the end of Some Like It Hot, where they're fleeing on the boat and uh, and Jack Lemmon's still dressed up like a lady. And the guy who's the, the man, old man who's driving the boat is going on and on about how they're going to have a life together and, and, and he won't let it go. And finally he rips the wig off and he's like, but I'm a man. And he's like, well, nobody's perfect. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> and the character's name was Felix, you said? It's another connection. Oh, there you go. And the, and the character's name was Felix. Um, we also had her earlier this year as Kathy Fremont in The Children, the smoking pregnant woman who gives birth to the radioactive child at the end <laughs> of the movie. Uh, yeah, I didn't like this movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I think we've covered that it should have stayed a play. Um, that I, I it's it seems like a a decision mm-hmm. to have them act like it's still a play because th- there's a different form of acting that's called for. Yeah, when you adapt it to film, and they're not doing that; they're just pretending it's a play still. Especially when he's doing these like choreographed jokes before he answers the door with his wife like that that's the most exaggerated he gets with his motions yeah so like he's pantomiming dragging someone along the room yeah so so here's the problem it's like so so because so in in a stage performance you you can't really have a lot of action that takes you all over the place. Like it's difficult to to jump around from location to location and right. all of that stuff. And so you rely very heavily on a lot of dialogue to kind of get across everything that's happening in the story as opposed to action, right? Yeah. And the problem is that in a in a movie, in a film when you're not having a lot of action to get you from scene to scene and a lot of things happening, you have very intimate moments of dialogue. And I feel like because you can't, it's it's hard to do intimate in a theater setting because you are projecting out to an entire room, an entire audience. We lose that here. And we needed the that, we needed it to be cut in, in a closer, more intimate way. You needed to trim the dialogue and let more of the like actor come through with their expressions and stuff like that instead of just keeping all of these words in there and, and, and keeping it just, you know, 
like in in wide shots that just didn't really give us a good connection to the characters. Yeah, it it they they just did it wrong. They left it a play, and it and it and it's not enjoyable to watch in, in a film. And I love Jack Lemon, and I think what he's doing here is great stage acting, but. It's not good acting for a movie, and he got an Oscar nomination for it, yeah. which I feel like was more likely because he's Jack Lemon. But it's not like he's a neglected – like, doesn't he have an Oscar for The Apartment in 60? I, I thought he did, but let me check. So it's it's not like this is something – this isn't Scorsese and The Departed where they're like, whoops, we better get this to this guy before he dies. Um, this is like – He's a he's a celebrated actor. It's not like he was under celebrated. Mr. Roberts in fifty six, and uh, Save the Tiger in seventy four. He has Oscars for both of those. Yeah, he but, was he was nominated for the Apartment and Some okay. Like It Hot, but he didn't win. Either way, I just feel like there's there's people who deserve that nomination over him this year, in spite of him being Jack Lemmon. Yeah, I I agree, and 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 maybe it's because they're like, well, if you win a Tony for doing a stage play, he like didn't that, win the Tony though. Oh, he, he was, was just nominated. nominated. Mm. Well, maybe they thought he was snubbed for the Tony, and they're like, well, we'll give them the Oscar for the movie version or something, you know? Like you wait the Tony. <laughs> That's a fatso reference. <laughs> <laughs> because Jack Oni. Lemmon famously the wandered Oni. into the Tonys and ate a Tony. No, Dom DeLuise showed up with all the with all the awards, and he ate mm. three quarters of them. Mm. Um, <laughs> I also don't think. I mean, I like Robbie Bitsit as much as you do. I don't think he's doing a great job here. He he's playing the character in a very strange way, and again, not having seen the play, maybe that's how the character is supposed to be. Yeah. But it it seems like he has trouble expressing his emotions. Yeah. For sure. But also his grievances. Like, I don't even know what he's mad about most of the time. And so many of the scenes are a retread of, you weren't around. a dad enough yeah. for me. Like, you, were, you weren't you were around enough. And you were a lot of fun, but you weren't, but you were never there. And it's like, wait, how was I fun and never there? Like, yeah. but every argument they have is the same, where it's like, I don't appreciate you because you weren't a good enough dad right. to me or you weren't the dad I wanted. Right. But at no point do we reconcile this even even up into to the end do they have this the, that intimate moment yeah. to be like i'm really starting to understand you now we've had a close heart to heart and we're we're figuring it out yeah uh, unless we're supposed to imply that his father taking the straight lines in their last acting out of that sketch is an indication that he's going to completely change and it's like well they write that off immediately when he pantses himself right. on stage before he leaves and it's right. like and okay he still wants to be the clown of the two right. of them. his son forced him into that role walking in and giving him the setup to a joke yeah he, he had to be the straight man like it, it it wasn't really his choice to change yeah really this feels like a son overcoming a vague grudge that he had against his father it's not a movie about the father changing. It's a movie about the son going, oh, I'm kind of being just a little shit about this. I need to just accept my father for who he is. The end. But uh, I generally just felt annoyed by this movie. Yeah, and I don't think it's Jack Lemmon's fault as much as it's uh, Bob Clark's fault that he's overacting the scenes that he is. Because he should have said, "No, let's bring this down." If this feel, this is a weird energy for this shot yeah. that we're getting. Well, yeah, you could have cut thirty minutes out of this movie. You could have cut half the dialogue of every scene, and you and you could have like had them actually, you know, express emotions and talk to each other, and it and it would have been a decent movie. Also, tribute is a shit title for this movie, unless you just wanted to save money by by charging that billboard to advertising for the movie <laughs> the, the one in yeah like, whatever like it is. this movie being called tribute is nothing but a spoiler to the mm-hmm. sequence that it ends yeah is that what the play is called yeah but i i don't i don't like the title i don't yeah. think it represents the story very well i agree um do we know where this goes letterboxd jess oh by the way thumbs down for me thumbs down thumbs down right. yeah <laughs> I think that you're both like looking at me like we're just gonna give it a thumbs up because <laughs> that idiot loved this one. 
uh, it's, it's sadly pretty low on my list. Um, I mean, sadly, because, you know, it's a Jack Lemmon movie and it's not where it ought to be. Uh, it is 114. It is below Resurrection and above Times Square. All right, Richard. Uh, I have it at number 99, uh, which puts it below Times Square, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but above the formula. I have it at 143, which is just under the kidnapping of the president, but above phobia. I think that's everything for tribute. If you have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd. Or as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. Please consider rating us on iTunes to help people find the show. And if you take the time to leave us a review, we will thank you personally in an upcoming episode. If you're feeling especially generous, you can also support the show through Patreon.com slash VintageVideoPodcast. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Altered States which IMDb describes like so. A psychophysiologist experiments with drugs and a sensory deprivation tank and has visions he believes are genetic memories. He's not a crazy physiologist. His his title is psychophysiologist. Yes. (laughs) If you want a a crazy physiologist, go rent Simon. (laughs) Same movie, but as a comedy from earlier this year. Um, we leave you now with the trailer for Altered States. In the basement of one of the country's leading medical schools, Dr. Edward Jessup, candidate for a Nobel Prize, is conducting the most dangerous experiment in the history of science. And the subject of the experiment is himself. <laughs> Ask him what kind of an experience I can expect. It's deafening. The noise is deafening. It's blacked out. What happens during these blackout periods is you get the feeling of phenomenal acceleration, like you're being shot out over millions, billions of years. Time simply obliterates. You guys are shooting off with an untested drug that stacks up in the brain and works in the nucleus of the cell, and you don't call that dangerous. Now, I'm asking you to put the experiment off until we understand a little more in order to minimize the risk. I'm really frightened. We could be screwing around with this whole genetic structure. Now, how do we stop this? We've got millions of years stored away in that computer bank we call our minds. We have got trillions of dormant genes in us, our whole evolutionary past. Perhaps I've tapped into that. He may be on to something that is beyond our own comprehension. Now, because I believe him, I want this thing stopped. The hell was that? You okay? If you love me, if you love me, Eddie, get fired! Altered States.